Today we will be covering the skill of lumbar puncture. This skill may be required to diagnose meningitis, identify a subarachnoid hemorrhage if it is not demonstrated on a CT scan, or to support a diagnosis of a neurologic condition like Guillain-Barre or multiple sclerosis. This procedure can be both diagnostic and therapeutic for benign intracranial hypertension. This procedure should not be performed on anyone with an abnormal mental status, focal neurologic deficit, or with concern for obstructing mass lesion without prior neuroimaging, such as a CAT scan. Informed consent should be obtained discussing the risk of bleeding, infection, nerve damage, and the common complication of headache following the procedure. The goal of this procedure is to place a hollow bore needle into the spinal canal through the posterior neuroforamen of the lumbar spine by aiming a needle between the superior and inferior spinous processes in the midline of the back. The most common errors in performance of this procedure are relative to patient positioning or improper spinal alignment that can make needle passage and placement more difficult. Small changes may make the needle pass to the side of the target. Careful and deliberate adjustments in the needle position will improve success. The patient may be placed either in the lateral decubitus position with a towel roll under the patient's head to maintain spinal alignment or in a seated position with the patient leaning over a bedside tray or table. Placing the tray or table against a wall will decrease the risk of this aid sliding during the procedure. In either position, the patient should flex forward to try and open up the space between the spinous processes. Begin by palpating and identifying landmarks. The most commonly used landmark is the iliac crest of the patient. Followed horizontally, this space lines up with the L4-L5 interspace. The space above and below this level may be used for insertion. Begin by opening the sterile kit on a nearby surface. Then, place a face mask and sterile gloves before beginning the procedure. Some kits may require the addition of chlorhexidine or betadine if they are not included, but most commercially available kits have all the materials required. Begin by cleansing the skin of the patient with betadine or chlorhexidine, then place a sterile drape over the area. Be sure to clean a space large enough to allow selection of a new site above or below the initial vertebral interspace selected. Draw up 1% lidocaine and inject a small wheel at the planned insertion site using the small needle included in the kit between the spinous process is palpated. Be sure to talk with and describe the steps to the patient as you are performing them, as often the patient is awake but unable to see what is about to happen. Once a wheel has been injected, a longer needle may be used along the planned trajectory of the spinal needle to anesthetize the track. This will also give an indication of bony obstructions that may be encountered if palpation was difficult, and can help with the direction for final needle placement. Insert the needle containing lidocaine fully, providing a slight negative pressure during insertion to ensure no vascular structure is encountered. Make sure that you stop the needle just prior to entering into the subarachnoid space. Once the planned depth has been reached, inject along the track as you withdraw. While the anesthetic takes effect, you can set up and open the fluid collection tubes from the kit, being sure to note the correct numerical order of the tubes to allow differentiation of cell counts between beginning and later tubes. The manometer may also be assembled at this time if you plan to measure an opening pressure in suspected intracranial hypertension or meningitis. This measurement can only be taken if the patient is in the lateral decubitus position. Remember that the arm on the stopcock has the word OFF written on it, 
and should be oriented to allow fluid to flow from the needle hub up into the manometer chamber. A normal opening pressure is 8 to 20 centimeters of water. As you prepare to insert the spinal needle, be sure to review the orientation of the needle hub and the bevel. The direction of the bevel of the needle is denoted by a notch or bump at the needle hub. Ensure that any time you advance or withdraw the needle that the hub is engaged with the stylet. This stylet will occlude the needle tip. Correct orientation of the bevel relative to the patient and use of the stylet minimizes tearing of the meninges during insertion and can help the opening created to heal following the procedure. The stylet will also prevent a small nerve fiber from getting pulled outward from the spinal canal upon removal. Advance the needle deliberately and firmly at the planned insertion site, aiming at the umbilicus of the patient. If resistance is encountered, withdraw the needle and ensure a midline trajectory before inserting again. Make small, deliberate changes in the angle of needle insertion. If you reach an extreme of angle without return of fluid, you may try again changing the angle in a reverse manner. Be sure to check for fluid periodically during insertion by removing the stylet. Fluid should be evident within one to two seconds of stylet removal if the correct space has been entered. Never apply negative pressure to the spinal needle during insertion. Fluid should return spontaneously when the correct space is encountered. Once fluid begins to flow, you may attach the manometer for pressure measurements or begin collection within the fluid tubes. Be sure to collect a minimum of 1 cc per tube to allow analysis in the lab. More fluid may be needed in one of the later tubes if you plan to run viral or fungal cultures for evaluation, but larger volumes of fluid removed increase the risk for headache following the procedure. At the completion of the procedure, reinsert the stylet and remove the needle and stylet together in a single motion. A standard bandage may be placed at this time. Providing hydration following the procedure can decrease the risk for headache. Maintaining a recumbent position following the procedure may be more comfortable for some, but has not been shown to universally decrease the risk of post-LP headache.